I'd request uh, the dignitaries of the day to please come up on the dais. Group Director Dr. Salunke, our chief speakers, Mr. Sudhindra Venkatesh and Mr. Manohar Paluri. Give them a big hand, please. So today is the uh, fifth day of this uh, workshop and it's a pleasure to have you amidst us to uh, motivate further, enlighten our students who are participants as well as be a part of the uh, demonstrations. I'd request our uh, colleague up here to kindly proceed. Dr. Salunke, can you please felicitate our guests? We'd request Piyush to join us in this, please. Thank you so much, sir. Mr. Sudhindra Venkatesh will be our first speaker for the day. Sir, you can be on the dais and I'd request our other dignitaries to please take their seat in the audience. Sudhindra Venkatesh, he is the Chief Design Officer at IBM India. He is a recognized thought leader in design thinking, service design, brand experience design, and human-centered design. In the field for over 19 years, he has been recognized for his work through more than 14 international awards, including Most Innovative Product by National Infocom Awards in Singapore, a Blue Elephant at Curious Category Best in Interactive Media Awards, and Internet Advertising Awards. It's a pleasure to be listening to you today, sir. All Thank over. You. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Talking about responsible design leadership, kind of loaded a bit for a Saturday morning, but bear with me, by the, by the time you finish, you'll actually uh, know what it all means, and you can unpack it for me better than I would. But are you all having a good time in the workshop? So it's, it's a great initiative. Thank you so much for, you know, firstly having me over. Thank you so much. It's a privilege to be here. Uh, to be able to share my thoughts with all of you. And also, it's so important for, from an uh, India perspective, right? So it's such an important conversation today. Design is an important conversation. So thanks so much for taking the lead, MIT and uh, the We School from Wellinker. So thank you so much. It's, it's fantastic. Really, really good. And in that context is where this whole talk of mine fits in. Design is the conscience of an organization today. So it's, it's not screens, it's not the products that you create, it's not the services that you create alone, but it is the very conscience through which an organization operates. And that's my basic premise and opening premise of my, of my talk. You are the uh, people who are going to ask the tough questions in an organization. You are batting for your user, you're batting for your people who probably are not even there, you know, in the room by, by, a, by far. So you are keeping the conscience in check of an organization. And that's where the responsible design leadership comes from. But before that, a quick introduction of mine. My name is Sudhindra uh, Venkatesh Murthy. My uh, full name, my first name is Sudhindra. Uh, I am with IBM for a while now. I've been for about four years, I'm uh, the chief design officer for IBM IX. IX is the, uh, is the place where the uh, design comes alive, and I'm very glad to see some of them uh, here in, uh, in this audience who have been as a part of that journey. I've been in the, uh, in the uh, business of design or in the, in the field of design for the last uh, couple of decades now, and the reason I've stayed is because of the human centricity of it. We say human-centered design, right? But do you have you heard of human-centered finance or human-centered legal? No, right? So the only profession that has human centricity built into it is design. And that's a huge responsibility all of us carry. It's something that has been given to us by the society, by the architects of, of uh, the whole discipline. And that is what has uh, motivated me to stay in design and evolve. Back in the day when I was, uh, when, you, when I used to be a designer, you know, um, many years ago, I used to play a support function. I used to sit in one corner and there was this giant 
of a man who used to come and say, hey, you know, you need to do this because it's feasible for me. And you need to do this because it makes more money for me. They did not ask me, how should the HR function in an organization should run? They did not ask me, how should, uh, you know, how should we transform our spaces that we sit in? They did not ask those questions many years ago. It was a support function. But I'm glad to say that we've evolved there, and now we're in a place where uh, I take the lead in those kind of conversations. How should the HR be? What should you do with automation you know, uh, uh, out there? What should you do with robotics? What do you want to do with the new services that you want to introduce? Which are the uh, best places for us to go and invest in? Those are all the questions that I'm involved in today, which I was not. So that, for me, has uh, kept me through this aspect. And uh, that means that you're already taking a leadership position automatically, right? But the journey in IBM of design, uh, IBM design started quite a long ago. This was uh, back in 1956, as you can see. This is the memo that uh, Dr. Thomas Watson, uh, one of those you know, big names in, in the world of uh, uh, computing and technology actually wrote to his senior vice presidents and leaders that uh, design is going to be big for us. In 1956, he is the one who coined good design is good business. Have you heard of the uh, phrase good design is good business? Have you heard of it? How many of you have heard of it? Yeah, good design is good business. Business. But did you know that this was uh, this came from one of the leaders of IBM? I didn't know till the time I joined IBM. Right? So that's the thing. So uh, we've been doing this for a long time now, long time now and somewhere along the way, um, there were different things that happened. But back in 2013, there was, uh, there was a sustainable effort, effort that was put in to create a design discipline. And that continues even today. So we have 57 studios across uh, the world. And the way we uh, kind of uh, look at that is where people practices and places come together. That's our uh, studio. And we are interested in the culture of design and design thinking, and not really just the you know, aspects of doing it. Right? That's, that's very important. So I'm, I, don't, I don't want to you know, talk too much about IBM. So that's, that's really not uh, what I'm looking to do. But there are a few slides I want to share just in the context of how we think about design. And that, that sort of serves as the background of my rest of the talk as well. Yeah. So we believe this, so I would like you to see this video. Thinking that I'm not a designer, I don't practice the craft of design, it's, it's perfectly okay because we and you as designers are a tiny sliver in the whole of IBM. It's just this percentage, it's like 0.2 percentage 
uh, in the world of IBM, which is 300 plus lakh, uh, 300 plus thousand in uh, IBM. So it's a small sliver. But the way we have bridged that gap is by this, by design thinking. So design thinking mindset is with half of IBM. And that's important. It's, uh, that's what we are trying to do. We're trying to bridge that gap of thinking in, in terms of change, in terms of transformation that you saw, in terms of being a guide. That's, that's why, you know, today when I say design, uh, I mean design and design thinking kind of synonymously. So you can have an academic debate about how they're different and stuff like that. But I, I'm, today I'm talking about kind of synonymously, both of them. So in IBM, we use this as, as our uh, defining practice, the enterprise design thinking, so which is driven by principles, the, the loop and the keys. And we have an entire career path for people who are interested in, um, in design. You have all these badges. You could become a fellow or a VP and uh, you know, sit in the leadership of uh, the whole of the organization. And you can you know, grow through the ranks. Uh, so this philosophy is uh, you know, primarily called the loop, which has the concepts of observation, fluid observation, reflection, and making. Right? So you must have. The last four days, you've, you must have seen the importance of reflection, right? How important it is. Did you all first try to jump into solutions? Did you all get this, the solutions the moment the problem was out there? We all got, right? We all thought, but this is already there. This is a solution. I know the solution to the traffic problem in Bangalore, right? So we all have those solutions. The problem is that we really want to identify the, why the real problem as well as reflect upon what's working and not, what's not working. And, to look at all those possibilities that are there. That's what is built into the process of, or the framework of design in IBM. And we don't use it, you know, believe me, it's not just for the societal problems, but actually the business problems. And it is very hard when you are driven, you know, quarter on quarter, you want quarter on quarter results, you have these markets to uh, play with, you have this huge amount of competition. And if I'm, I am as a designer telling my, uh, you know, a team to say, hey, reflect upon what we need to do, reflect upon that so nobody's listening at the time, right? It's pretty hard to actually get them to do. And that is uh, what we do day in and day out. And, and that is very important. So you, you, are, you cease to be uh, a person who is a practitioner. You cease to be something else. And what is that something else? Is where uh, my talk comes from. Right? So as, as you saw, one of the, one of the aspects of uh, being a designer in IBM as well as, and it's not about IBM alone, but as, as today's designer, one of the aspects is to be responsible for our actions. We were just talking today. In fact, I had a, a fantastic beginning to my talk because I had some great conversations along the way with Manohar and with uh, Mr. Uday Salonke as well. It's important that designers take a stand and take a stance of what they do. It's not enough to, you know, create more products and services and uh, you know, create more screens out there and, and you know, push people to buy more, for example. But it is actually important to take a stand. Just like the way Leo Tolstoy did. Tolstoy did. Authors, poets, they all take a stand in society today. That is why they're respected. I mean, there, are, there are innumerable number of poems and paintings and uh, you know, literature that comes out every single day. But who are the ones that you remember? And why do they do that? Is because they are, are uh, striking at the heart of what the society is talking about. And today design has evolved into that, to a place where you need to take a stand. And you need to, you know, you can look at responsible design leadership in a couple of ways. You know, you can, uh, you can also design responsible leadership in organizations as well. So you can play around with this word. It's a profound uh, kind of thought, at least for me, it is a guiding thought. All the three, right, so responsible, design and leadership, all of them, if you sort of unpack that, it's a pretty profound one. And that's what uh, I'm attempting to do today. So designer so far has been all of these, right? So it has been AR designer, user experience designer, and all of that stuff. So that's, that's really uh, what we think of designers. But today, we are in a multi-dimensional space. We are explorers of a multi-dimensional space. We live with robotics. We live with machines. Machines coexist with humans. Empathy coexists with engineering. There is AI, artificial intelligence, and natural intelligence. 
some might call it natural stupidity as well but they all coexist in the same space it's a multi dimensional space that we all live in therefore the role of a designer now becomes much more than becoming a product designer or a graphic designer it is a role of as you can say a change maker a futurist so you need to know what's happening in the future right we never had those responsibilities before i think when i started off i was kind of lived in simpler times nobody asked me how does the future look like 20 years from now but today i am answering those questions when an organization came to ibm just recently 6 months ago they said what well, we want to use iot you know in our business and we are an appliance uh, maker how do we look like or how will the world look like 20 years later do you think i have those answers no not really right i don't i don't carry those answers with me but you are in charge of finding those answers which makes you a leader of sorts right so designer needs to start thinking like a leader and stop thinking as a practitioner and that makes that's a huge difference i love this uh, quote by uh, tim brown and he was in one of those interaction conferences he spoke about this he actually said we create a world in our mind you know that's that's our power right at the end of the day the last four uh, days and you're going to create prototypes today you are creating a world in your mind we all don't know what is that world yet but it's in your mind right that's a power that we have now this particular world is a uh, is a responsibility when you put out there right that's a power also again has a huge responsibility in it so the question you will uh, you would want to ask i want to ask all of you is what sort of world do you want to create what you put out there is going to be real in the world so what sort of world do you want to create and it's a question that we need to ask now more than ever before and that's very important so uh, one of the worlds you can create is this numbers to a story right so there has been huge success in design and design thinking and that is why we all are talking so much about it that is why organizations large organizations are investing heavy amount of dollars in design for this reason because numbers are real this is a, a design management institute uh, you know study that is done in the uk and they saw over a 10 year period how uh, the design led companies that were riding they called it the d wave right the design wave those who did that were 228 uh, percent better than those who did not do it yeah over a 10 year period right? it's a big one for organizations believe me this is a great number to have right so 80 percent of of the companies that rode the d wave over the 10 year period 80% of them launched new products and services they increased their market share as well as they went into international markets to be precise uh, 83% of them increased their market share so which business does not want to do it so businesses are all looking for that right so they're in, they're trying to increase their market share and so on that is why uh, there is there is this whole notion of why we are in business is to to make money right so to actually create all of these things so there is uh, people who use design are successful and it is proving even more so today than ever before so numbers tell a story you can use that this is a story this is a world you can create where you have a lot more numbers lot more profits revenues all of that that's one type of looking at it but another way of looking at it is is this the only value that you want to unlock the value of money monetary is that the only value that you want to unlock right are there other values that you look, uh, that you can look at so uh bain and company did a study on what kinds of values that are there and they sort of mapped it against um the maslow's uh, hierarchy of needs so there are different kinds of values that you can unlock the social value for example the moral value the ethical value right so they actually did all of that so motivation affiliation and belonging they all their values so are we talking about that in our boardrooms are we talking about that in our own you know or, uh, discussions of creating products and services are we talking about that are we talk, putting measurements against those are those values we want to start unlocking now because that's i think is even more powerful because between those percentages is the real story percentages are not the story the whole world is between those percentages 
right? We go through our life not in this, you know, percentages way. We have a lot of other things that's going on. There is an emotional value that our products have for us. We were just talking about some really good examples, and Manohar, I'm sure, will share how Facebook is thinking of, of that as well. So we go through our lives much more than those just the numbers uh, and the percentages. So uh, from a responsibility point of view, that for us is the story and the world we have an opportunity to create. So what is meant by responsible, first of all? right? Responsible is having obligation to do something. It's taking ownership of your actions. It is to say that well, I have put this out there, so I am responsible for what comes out of it. So uh, Don Norman, uh, who's, you know, we all know Don Norman, right? Does anybody doesn't know Don Norman? Haven't heard of him? So he's one of the uh, top design leaders in the world who has actually influenced and shaped the way we think of design today. So he's been doing that for several years now. Initially, he said beauty is not important, and suddenly he said beauty is important. So it's all of that stuff, right? So he's an influential thought leader in design. So he wrote a book called Design of uh, Everyday Things, and which is like the guiding, like a Bible of design in a way. So he has now started off this whole concept called Design X. He's, he's again talking into the, in the same language of responsible design, where he's saying that it's not enough to create uh, you know, even more products and services and service the, uh, you know, the affluent class and create more consumerist societies and so on, can you use design to solve real problems such as malaria in Africa, right? Or malnutrition in lower, uh, you know, in underdeveloped countries and regions. So can we solve those kind of issues? Can we solve climate change? So for that, now can, can we do that as, as a few designers sitting here? It's very difficult to do. So that's why he has put this whole uh, thought together called Design X. It's, it's sort of a program uh, in which you have the communities coming together. For example, you have uh, you know, uh, some issue in a, in a region in Africa or, or India for that matter. So you take that, you have a community, you, you charge the community through the community experts that are there because they know in depth what's the problem that's going on. You enable them with the design tools and design thinking processes and framework, and along with them, actually, you become a facilitator of sorts for solving that particular problem. So Design X is his attempt of changing the world, of creating responsible design. Uh, Patagonia is another example we were just talking about today morning, uh, right? So Patagonia released a very famous ad three years ago on, on, a, on a Black Friday. They said, don't, don't buy this jacket. Do you remember? Anybody has seen that? Don't buy this jacket. That was their ad. And they said it takes 10,000, 12,000 liters to make this jacket. So they are in the business of making hiking gear. They said uh, it takes about 10,000, 12,000 liters to make this jacket. So don't buy it. We are selling it, but don't buy it. Because you're going to you know, disrupt the environment, right? You're going to uh, water is scarce today. So you don't want to do that. So they actually said don't buy it. And after that, it was not just a marketing gimmick. One of, the, one of the sadder things of the social kind of marketing is that they don't stick uh, to that principle later on. They actually use that to uh, sort of motivate people and then after that probably, I, I've never not uh, seen a lot of those organizations uh, go through that whole thing. But Patagonia after that started this whole thing called the Warnware or you know where you can give your second hand, uh, it's like a second hand shop. So you get your jackets and your hiking gear and they'll repair it for you. So that you don't go and buy a new one and then, you know, uh, cause this environmental thing, right? So how many of the organizations do you know have, have the courage to do it, right? So that's the thing. And now they're do really successful because today's uh, buying, uh, you know, the entire buying behavior is not on just the beauty or the uh, fashion consciousness, but it is also the value consciousness that goes with it. So a lot of people here in this room and outside buy because they align with the value. And Patagonia is doing really well in terms of business as well. Because they align with the value. And today, I am see, I'm here in India sharing this story. Again, see the power of what they have created. And that is, for me, responsibility. Uh, ITC, I'm staying in ITC actually. So uh, when I was uh, with, uh, I did some work with them for a, a few years ago. They've been speaking about responsible luxury. But today I was so hot, uh, was so good and heartened to see the fact that they're taking it to the next level. You know, the, there is nothing plastic 
inside the hotel rooms in IDC Grand Central. It's really good. It makes it a bit inconvenient. These small plastic bottles were so convenient for us. But it is inconvenient. But the fact is they've taken a stand and they said, no, we don't want to, uh, you know, increase plastic. There is zero plastic or at least close to zero plastic in the rooms, in the water bottles and all of that stuff. So it's, they are really serious about responsibility, uh, you know, as a concept in, in their luxury too. So what is design? So we saw responsible and what is design? So design is the intent behind an outcome. The simplest form of what you can say design is, is not the outcome itself, but the intent. Because we're all designing all the time, right? So at the end of the day, we have outcomes. Without the process of design thinking, without the framework of it, you still can get some really good outcomes. Don't, don't tell me that the whole world has not progressed so far without design thinking. There have been enough and more success stories without it. It was just that the intent was, was not very clear. Now, when you have the intent towards that particular outcome, it becomes, and that, that is what is really design all about. And today, design has taken a much larger role, as I said. It's a public conversation. It's not me that is saying, but it is the world leaders that are around that are talking about design being a public conversation. It's time to take on the biggest challenges that the world has ever seen, head on, and solve those problems. What are the biggest challenges that we have? I mean, I, I read Yuval Harari a lot, and three big challenges that he always speaks about, climate change, nuclear wars, and technology disruption. So these are three big challenges. Can we solve those or at least play a role in solving those? So that's, that's what, uh, you know, as a design discipline, one has to sort of think of. Now, there is, there is this good example I saw in uh, Ford. Uh, you know, what they did was uh, Ford's engineer. They, they find it, I mean, you always design uh, your dashboard, your your car uh, steering and then seats and all of that stuff, right? So this person in the middle is a designer or she's a, she's a technologist, you could say, you know, a developer of that uh, car thing, the product of car. Now, what happens is she is not an old person. She's pretty young and uh, she can get into outside of car pretty easily, right? So uh, it's, it's quite easy, you know, get in. Start your car and go, and it's so easy to use. Today's cars are really good. So that's exactly the mindset that probably she has. So it's very difficult for her to understand what her mother goes through when she's getting inside a car. Right, let me give you another example, WhatsApp. For me, it's so simple, so easy. It's like always there. My mother struggles with it. She uses WhatsApp. She really struggles. And I, I cannot find another simpler software to use. But for her, it's a struggle. Now, that, that's the point. So the obviousness of it is not obvious for us. Right? So what okay, and then bring it back. Then you need... Was interesting. And have a look. You are now mimicking approximately the same range of motion your mom just showed us. Mm. Okay. It's also going to make it difficult for you to bend and twist. Oh, okay. <laughs> These are headphones, and they're going to muffle the sounds around you. The third age suit is a suit that we use to simulate what it's like to be 20 to 40 years older, and we do that by limiting mobility in various joints in the body. It was like a complete workout just to get into the car. Walking in someone else's shoes, it changes their perspective. And if the only perspective you know is your own, then that's what you're going to design to. I think that's one of the best parts of my job, to watch my parents use the technology without my help. This experience has been mind-blowing. So mother, right? So, so she's, uh, she's, she's so happy that her daughter is going through the same thing. But there are two questions to, uh, to ask here and solve for. One of them is that it is also a product. You can also create this product, not just the car. The second thing is, there are some products out there which kind of cater to, like, for example, Stephen Hacking, Hawking has his own, uh, had his own, you know, system that he used to talk to and all of that stuff. But how many people can afford it? The other thing is affordance of it, right? So can people actually, affordability of it, can people use it? And is it, is it the right kind of price point for everybody to use, right? So that, those are the kind of questions that one has to ask. But these are the things that we should look at. And that is, that is what is heartening about some of these organizations. Ford is again very big on design thinking. Their CEO had a 
direct line with uh, David Kelly for 20 years when he was Steelcase CEO. Then he has now taken over um, Ford. He's a big, you know, big believer in design thinking. And you can see that uh, coming out. IKEA is another one. They're experimenting with uh, autonomous cars, self-driven cars. What has self-driven cars got to do with furniture, right, IKEA? So let's see what they have done. They are experimenting with, they have this uh, studio called uh, the Space 10. Space 10 is their innovation studio in IKEA. And they're experimenting with different kinds of concepts. They said that, can we uh, make a car into, you know, I came from Bangalore yesterday, right? So could I have been in an autonomous car, in a hotel, uh, kind of an autonomous car. But I sleep through my journey. I have a nice sleep. I come here, deliver my talk and go back. Is it possible? Instead of going through this whole airplane, come here, previous day, you know, all of that uh, thing. Can you do that? Can you have a mobile office? Can you have a mobile cafe? So they're experimenting with all kinds of different designs that are actually beneficial to the society using autonomous cars. Center for Human Tech is uh, an organization founded by Tristan Harris. So he, he used to be with Google before. So he is interested and he's, he actually talks about that how... Technology is actually disrupting us in everyday life. And what, what are the issues that are there? So a couple of videos to uh, talk about what if technology... Right now we often lack choice in technology when we relate to other people. Let's look at an example of messaging, interpersonal communication, or chat. We all face this situation where let's say there's two people, Nancy on the left and John on the right. And John remembers, ah, I need to ask Nancy for that document before I forget. And there's this all or nothing choice, because if he doesn't ask her right now, he is going to forget. So John either holds on to that thought, and is left with the burden on his mind of remember to ask Nancy or remember to ask Nancy, or he can get it off his mind and interrupt Nancy. So what does he do? He bulldozes her attention. And that's what we're doing all the time, we're bulldozing each other's attention. With text, with chat, messaging, and all sorts of digital interpersonal communication. And every time we do that, there's a serious cost. There's a woman named Gloria Mark at UC Irvine who does this research on interruption science. And her research shows that it takes us about 23 minutes on average to resume our focus after being interrupted. It also shows that if we get a whole bunch of external interruptions in an hour, the next hour we'll self-interrupt ourselves more. And maybe you can relate to feeling like you've lost your whole day to a combination of interruptions and self-interruptions. So how do we fix this? Let's say we introduce Nancy with a new choice, and Nancy can mark that she's focused. Now John still needs to ask her for that document, except now when he hits send, he sees that it will hold the message and deliver it as soon as Nancy is no longer focused. Now you're all probably thinking, wait a second, Nancy would never do this because she's worried she's going to miss something, and what if there's something important or an emergency? But what if that's all communicated up front, and she knows John has a way of escalating any message? She can be focused and know for sure that if something important comes in, she'll get the interruption she needs. What this creates is instead of mindless or accidental interruptions, there's conscious interruptions, right? It's also changed the design question. We've changed the goal from let's make it really easy to send a message to one another, which is a pretty good goal, but we've upgraded that goal to help people communicate with each other well. What if technology was on your team to help you live by your values? So again, a very simple concept, uh, right? So simple idea to uh, create, reduce dis distractions. And there are quite a few of that, right? So today I'm connected with my colleague on Facebook, on LinkedIn, on Instagram, on Slack, on Mural, and also good old phone. And I also meet this colleague and I go to the office. So which conversation are we picking up from where? So I don't even uh, actually understand. Because there are far too many productivity tools which has in decreased the productivity of people. Isn't it? So, so the fact there is uh, how can we bring in these simple things also to start with to uh, change the way we can uh, create better technology. One more example. If you're like me, 
You've too often been sitting at an airport or crammed onto a middle seat of a plane at some horrid hour, either late at night or early in the morning, and you're thinking to yourself, why didn't I just spend those extra $40 on that other flight? We like to think that we're making conscious choices, but when we're all in a rush, the more we rely on the menus in front of us. Hipmunk is a travel website that recognized this, and they let you sort choices by human values. It's not just price or duration, but they let you sort by agony. They do this because they ask themselves, what is sorting for a price or duration about? It's not just about the raw numbers, it's about the human experience and values behind travel. So it's important to ask ourselves, what are the human values at stake in this choice? Another example where technology can help us live by our values could be when you're looking for directions from point A to point B. Of course we know we could walk, but what if since you've told your phone in your settings that you've been wanting to exercise, it put a choice on life's menu that said, or you could walk and here's the fitness goal you could achieve by doing so. Or maybe in your settings, instead of valuing exercise, you've said you valued productivity, so it offers up a podcast you might like to finish in that time. 28 minutes left in the podcast, 30 minute walk, it's on your team. There could be menus that sort choices by what matters to you. We can upgrade the goal from getting to point A to point B efficiently, to getting from point A to point B well. And remember, no one decides what well means to you, but you. What if technology was on your team to help that's you the, live by your values? Yeah, that's the operating model, right? So what if technology was in your team? So technology is going to play a very important role in your prototypes when you come up with, I'm sure you'll have a lot of technology-based solutions. So uh, it's going to play an important role. So can you think of it being on your team and what are the ways in which it can be on your team? And that brings to my, uh, the third one that we spoke about, the responsible design leadership. Now, leadership is the purpose for something for which something is designed. Earlier on, we did not probably ask that enough. We said we need to design this, so we designed, you know, for that. Made it very easy uh, and made it very, uh, you know, easy for people to use and uh, looked at people's behaviors and all of that stuff. Very good. But we did not ask why are we designing it in the first place. So today, in leadership, you're going to ask the question, why are we even designing it in the first place? The purpose of why something exists. The other thing of leadership is also the courage and the conviction and the rigor to take it through to the last level of detail. Of that's, that's leadership all about, right? So if you ask any leader in an organization or anywhere in the, in the world, any society, uh, any entity, he will tell you that. It is about having a vision, having a purpose, and also having the rigor to take it uh, to that. Now, one of those examples is uh, Carlos uh, Pastor, Rodriguez Pastor. So he, he is uh, the CEO of Intercorp company in Peru. Uh, he got a call once, you know, a few years ago, uh, many years ago, actually. His father told him that, you know, I'm, I've just got an, uh, acquired a bank in Peru called the Interbank. Why don't you come and join me? So this, this he was in uh, New York. Carlos Pastor was in uh, New York. And he was a VP in Citibank. He was, a, he was in nice, uh, in his own a little apartment, and he thought, why should I go back to Peru in this small bank? I'm already a VP in Citibank. Should I not continue? He did not make a logical choice for him. But what his father said was very interesting. So he said, don't think of the bank that I acquired, Interbank, as a small bank. Think of it as a 25th largest bank. There are only 25 banks in Peru. He said, think of this as a 25th largest bank, which is a different orientation. So he was pretty inspired by that. He took that call at the time. He took a flight to Peru. Actually, he became a part of the team. And today, Interbank is the fourth largest bank in Peru. And they were the first ones to introduce online banking. They're by far the most profitable. And not only that, he started off with uh, schools that teach design thinking, working with IDEO. So he's a big believer in design thinking. And you can see the way his vision is, right? It is not about making more money. It's not about creating more companies. But it's actually making the middle class families stronger. So he knows his resources, his strength. It is to align with the middle class families. And if I can make them stronger, their life stronger, their economy stronger, democracy will prevail in Peru. A country which has been ravaged by coups, military coups, every other year there is a military coup in Peru. So he is talking about you know, uh, retaining democracy through design. And uh, there, is, there is a whole uh, kind of things that they do. They actually 
as they have this process, right? They uh, begin with a great project, then they create a host of services, and then they think of what is needed for the future. They have schools, they have banks, they have supermarkets, all of the places where middle school folks go to, they have all those products and services created and all in one ecosystem. And uh, he has also created what is called as a La Victoria Lab, which is uh, dedicated to improve the lives of Peruvian uh, families through human-centered innovation. A big believer in design thinking. And the kind of change he has brought in, the kind of vision that he has, is an inspiration for all of us. Right? So that's the kind of leadership is what I'm talking about. So in closing, this is the you know, question that all of us need to ask for ourselves. In our organizations, in, our, in the uh, entities that we are part of, wherever we are part of. Right? So you can use design as form giving, as, as something that gives form to products. You can uh, use design as a process or as the, you know, the design thinking uh, process or framework. But you can also go to responsible design and actually create change and transformation within the society, go beyond the you know, aspects of business. So because as we were talking in the morning, business is a subset of society and it's not the other way around. So if you drive transformation in society, it is good for society and business. So that's what I wanted to talk to you all about today. Thank you so much. Other time for questions?